If you haven't seen the film Believe Land, you should. It's a great film. I have nothing but respect for its writers and director, as well as Cleveland fans and their suffering. Believe Land details all the events that have tortured Cleveland sports fans over the years. Each event has its own unique moment-defining name. My initial reaction watching the film was that Minnesota was just as tortured and had its own versions of each of these events, which were just as heartbreaking, if not more so. For example, the catch refers to Willie Mays' over-the-shoulder catch in Game 1 of the 1954 World Series between the Giants and Indians. Minnesota's catch? Ours was a Hail Mary and came with a push-off. The drive refers to John Elway and the Broncos marching down the field in the last five minutes to tie the 1986 AFC Championship game. Our drives, there were two of them, were in Arizona. The Cardinals were down 11 points with seven minutes left and scored twice, including an onside kick and a last-second 4th and 25 touchdown pass to seal it. I can still hear Paul Allen screaming no in my head. The fumble refers to Ernest Biner dropping the ball at the goal line in the 1987 AFC Championship game. But on that very same day that Biner fumbled that ball, the Vikings' Darren Nelson dropped what would have been a game-tying catch at the goal line on the last play of the NFC Championship. The trade? It's not shown in the film, but I think it refers to Rocky Colavito. Unless you're talking about the Red Sox trading Babe Ruth, I'm not sure you can argue about bad trades with a Vikings fan. The move refers to Art Modell taking the Browns to Baltimore. But three years before that happened, Norm Green moved our North Stars to Dallas. Initially, I tried comparing the number of championships between Cleveland and Minnesota. But that just didn't seem to truly convey the disappointment that Minnesotans have lived through, and it made me wonder if championships are even the best measure. This film is a rebuttal to the Believe Land film presenting the case to prove just how tortured Minnesota sports fans truly are. It's also my attempt to laugh at our misfortune, rather than cry. While watching the Believe Land documentary and taking note of all the similarities between Cleveland and Minnesota, this picture appeared on the screen. And yes, that's a Minnesota North Stars logo. In a documentary about Cleveland. The men in the photo are George and Gordon Gund, who were brothers. They were businessmen who were born in Cleveland and owned a few different sports franchises. But they're probably most famous for owning the Cleveland Cavaliers, who they bought in 1983, saving the team from the previous owner, the infamous Ted Stepien, who was threatening to move to Toronto. When the Guns bought the team, the roster was so bare that they had to start with nothing because Stepien had traded away multiple years of the team's first round draft picks. Sound familiar? The NBA eventually instituted a rule limiting how many first round picks you could trade. But to Cleveland, the guns were considered heroes, so much so that the basketball arena was named after them at one point. But before all that, they owned hockey teams. In the 70s, the guns were minority owners of the California Golden Seals, who played in the Bay Area. But the team struggled financially. And in 1976, the Guns persuaded the other owners to move the Seals to their hometown of Cleveland and rename the team the Barons. The Barons played in Cleveland for two years, but attendance and finances were actually worse in Cleveland than they were in California. In an attempt to save the team, they offered to merge the Barons with the North Stars in 1978, who were also struggling financially. As a part of that deal, the Guns became majority owners of the North Stars. They owned the Stars from 1978 to 1990. And in 1990, they threatened to move the North Stars to San Jose. So just to be clear, Cleveland's hero owners who saved the Cavaliers from being moved to Toronto tried to take our North Stars away. At face value, it's easy to see it that way, but that's not quite the whole story. In the Bob Showers book about the history of the North Stars, Lou Nanny said that the Guns were the best pro sports owners that the Twin Cities ever had. Lou Nanny is a Minnesota sports legend. He played hockey for the Gophers as well as the North Stars. He was also a coach, GM, and president at different points in his career. Nobody knows more about Minnesota hockey. So why would he say the Guns were such great owners when they tried to take the North Stars away? I had to find out. And because he's just an all-around great guy, he agreed to an interview. In the book, you say the Guns are the best sports owners the Twin Cities ever had. Yeah. How, why? So. How so? Because they were really committed to the area. They never, ever 
said no to anything that was needed here for the building, the team, uh, the city. Uh, they were very agreeable to doing everything that they could to make it a success. They were putting their own money into buildings to do things. For instance, the, when we needed suites, they put 20 uh, suites in and they paid for it. Where, if you take a look at all the other owners in town and all the other sports, they've all had concessions to fix their building, do things in their building. So if the guns were such great owners, why did they want to move the team? First, there was a land deal that went bad. You know, the land right next to Met Center that eventually turned into the Mall of America. The guns, you know, made it an offer to uh, buy the thing. They, they really felt they had the deal sold and bought. And then uh, they were going to, one of their brothers is Graham Gunn, and he's an architect. And he'd already come up with plans for a shopping center and the whole works. And at the last minute, though, even though they, it wasn't a signed deal, but it was an agreed to deal. And somehow, uh, people that control that, and I don't want to give names and stuff right. like that, but yeah. they pulled the plug on it and sold it to, I think it was Art Petrie from Mankato, who then eventually sold it to the Garmazians. Do you think that would save the team if they had gotten that? Probably team? would have, because the guns might have, uh, you know, put more mint money into the building themselves rather than looking to move. At the time this all started, the North Stars didn't own Met Center. They were tenants and had to pay rent. Met Center was 20 years old and needed some upgrades for the North Stars to be able to make enough money and keep the team afloat. The Gun Brothers asked many times for improvements to be made at the Met Center and were told no at every turn. And the only way to get more revenue and generate a lot more revenue is have suites. So we had already added 20 and we were very successful with them. But uh, the guns paid for that themselves. Now we figured we'd like to add about another 46, 47 suites right along the sides. And the guns, as I said, went to the Sports and Facilities Commission, wanted a $15 million uh, commitment from them to fix the building and do other things. And they would sign a 20 year lease. Well, they wouldn't give us any money. So the guns were not going to stay around in that building knowing what was coming, where the sport was heading, and without having the ability to generate the revenues needed to, to succeed. But the guns could get a better deal in San Jose, including the arena. San Jose at that time was willing to build a building, give it to the guns, and have the team move there. But thanks to Lou Nanny's maneuvering with league officials, he was able to negotiate a deal where the Guns would get an expansion franchise in San Jose and Minnesota could keep the North Stars if another buyer could be found. The Stars were then sold to Howard Baldwin and Morris Belsberg. But part of that deal was that the Guns were able to take half of the North Stars roster in what was called a dispersal draft. And with the team still not doing well financially, the North Stars were sold to Norm Green a month later. And we all know the rest of the story, right? Norm moved the team to Dallas, and we all hate him for it. Norm, you suck. Norm? He sucks. <laughs> Norm! Yeah, ditto, ditto what they said. Norm sucks. Norm sucks. Norm sucks. Norm Green sucks. Yeah. Norm, Norm, you Norm. suck. Norm Green sucks. Norm Green, you suck. Norm sucks. Hey, Norm, all you gotta say, you suck. Though it's been said many times, many ways. <laughs> ways. <laughs> Norm sucks. When I started this project, I wanted to blame Norm too, and I expected to find evidence that proved it but I didn't. I know this is going to challenge your inner Minnesota nice, but hear me out. When Norm bought the team, nothing changed. He wanted to make improvements, but was constantly told no as well. He was even willing to make a long-term commitment to Minnesota if the commission would agree to let him make improvements with his own money and not interfere. He was losing a ton of money, and, and he put in $7 million in the building to upgrade the building when the Sports and Facilities Commission wouldn't. He, he did all the seats and all of it you know, and, and different things in the building had to be done. So he committed a lot of money. And, and then he even wanted to, because he couldn't get any help from the Sports and Facilities Commission, he wanted to have a shopping center. He was going to build himself from the Met Center to the uh, Mall of America. And he would pay for it and everything. But that would help him, you know, he figured, you know, he'd be able to make enough revenue from that to offset the losses he had in the building. But they turned him down on that too, so. So why were the Guns, Howard Baldwin, and Norm Green denied funding for improvements? The 
powers to be downtown basically were were trying to force the guns to move downtown because they didn't want you had the new target center they didn't want two buildings competing but the north stars tried that lou nanny went to negotiate with the timberwolves owners to play at target center but they couldn't come to an agreement over advertising and to go down and meet with the uh from the Wolves, and Marvin Harv, and Marvin Harv, basically, and Bob Stein, and try and strike a deal where we would go downtown to play there. They'd give us a good enough arrangement. We went down and came very close to making the deal, but at the last minute, Marv wouldn't uh, relent on, on keeping the rights to all the advertisers in the building, and saying that we could sell the advertisers, but they had to be the advertisers they had in the building. They couldn't be a competing advertiser. And that killed the deal. Without advertising revenue, moving downtown wouldn't have improved the situation any more than staying at Met Center. And without the improvements at Met Center, the North Stars wouldn't have been able to stay afloat financially. Rather than letting the franchise go under, Norm moved the team. So if Norm isn't to blame, who is? You mentioned the, the powers that be, and I'm assuming you mean the Metropolitan Sports Commission, right? Yeah, exactly. The Metropolitan Sports Commission was formed in 1977 by the state legislature to manage and oversee sports venues. But the Met Center was built 10 years earlier. So how did the Metropolitan Sports Commission come to own the Met Center? When Met Stadium was built in the mid-50s, a committee was formed to own and oversee the stadium and property. It was called the Metropolitan Sports Area Commission. When the Met Center was built in the mid-60s, the North Stars owners turned the title to the property over to the commission on some sort of good faith handshake deal. When the North Star owners, ownership bought the building, they essentially uh, gave it to the commission for a dollar, I think it was, and the commission operated the building and okay. or had the ownership and, and then was supposed to be in charge of all the things and uh, improvements and everything else. To me, this is one of the most curious parts of the story because the upkeep of the Met Center and who had the power to make those decisions ultimately led to the North Stars leaving. In 1977, the state legislature enacted a law to create a new commission called the Metropolitan Sports Facilities Commission. It was to manage and oversee the sports venues, but also to decide whether to renovate Met Stadium or build a new stadium in a different location, which would eventually become the Metrodome, and thus sometimes being referred to as the Metrodome Commission. In December of 1977, the old commission turned over ownership of the Bloomington property to the new commission. Because that included the entire property, they also turned over ownership of Met Center as well. The Facilities Commission consisted of seven voting members, including a chairperson. The commissioners were unpaid and served four-year terms, so there was quite a bit of turnover. However, the committee also had a non-voting executive director that was salaried and had no term limit. The executive director of the Metropolitan Sports Commission during this whole thing was a man named Bill Lester. An unnamed source with over 25 years experience in Minnesota politics told me that the chairperson didn't really have any power. Most people had no idea who the chairs even were. And even though he didn't have a vote, Lester was really in charge of the commission and he had a huge amount of power. I don't think that Bill Lester intended for the North Stars to leave, but the fact is that it happened on his watch. The commission may have been trying to muscle the North Stars downtown, but in reality, they forced the North Stars to choose between leaving town or going bankrupt. And I'm definitely not trying to make Norm Green out to be some sort of hero. He isn't. I've been told he wasn't the nicest person. He was difficult to work with and very stubborn. There was even a sexual harassment lawsuit that was settled out of court. Who better to point the finger at than someone who wasn't one of us and displayed less than favorable character? But the truth is, he had no choice and I think we've been blaming the wrong person all these years. And that brings us back to our Cleveland connection. Just like Art Modell will always be hated in Cleveland for moving the Browns, whether he was justified or not, Norm Green will always be hated here. Knowing how it felt to lose the North Stars, I can understand how Browns fans felt. Even though the North Stars left three years before the Browns left Cleveland. Minnesota's considered the state of hockey. It may not be as popular as the NFL, but hockey may be more popular here than anywhere else in the country. It's a Minnesota thing. Besides, Cleveland got to keep the Browns' name and eventually got them back. The NHL came back to Minnesota in 2000 as the Wild. And guess where they play? Downtown. 
downtown St. Paul, not Minneapolis. And that new hockey arena cost $130 million. That's a whole lot more than the North Stars were asking to upgrade Met Center. It's great to have hockey back, but when the North Stars left, they took a part of me with, and it's never felt the same. The North Stars have been gone now almost as long as they were here, and I'm willing to bet that the fans who've only known the Wild in their lifetime will grow up loving them as much as I love the North Stars. So does Norm still suck? Absolutely. I even have a t-shirt that says so. I actually have two. But is he to blame for the North Stars leaving? I don't think so. And you know who else sucks? Dallas. Dallas, we want our stars back and all the Vikings we gave you too. And about this whole Cleveland being tortured thing, Minnesota doesn't feel bad for you. Well, maybe a little. And maybe championships aren't the best measure of how tortured and cursed a fan base is. The next few parts might be hard to watch at times, but keep in mind that this is meant to be therapeutic and exercise our demons like Believe Land did for Cleveland. They won the NBA championship shortly after that film was released. I've been a Minnesota sports fan for over 40 years. After all the heartbreak we've suffered, it's impossible to remain hopeful without laughing about it every once in a while. After all, laughter is the best medicine, so try to see the humor in it and let the healing begin. And believe it or not, this is ultimately about hope. Somewhere deep down, even the most grizzled and cynical of us hopes that this might just be the year. We all want our teams to do well, otherwise why would we keep watching? And it's not all bad. The Lynx have won four championships in the last eight years. Gopher Women's Hockey have seven championships, the last one in 2016. The Whitecaps won their championship this year and the Vixen were runners-up in 2018. So if we aren't using championships as our measure, how do we define how tortured Minnesota sports fans are? I think we're just going to have to lay back on the Minnesota sports therapist couch and get it all out, warts and all. Seven Fort Wayne, Martin down the court, over to Pollard. Harrison fires to Mikan. And when Big George hits at 69-68, the Lakers. This one is close. Pollard takes it down the floor for the Lakers. He hands off to Martin. Doogie feeds Mikan, and it's good again. George Mikan and the Minneapolis Lakers won five NBA championships in the 1940s and 50s. But with attendance declining, team owner Bob Short moved the team to the West Coast before the 1960 season. Since moving to LA, the Lakers have won 11 championships. In 1967, the ABA was formed, and its offices were in Minneapolis, with a familiar face as commissioner. Minnesota's original team, the Muskies, moved to Miami after the first season. The following year, the Pipers moved here from Pittsburgh, but they also moved after one season. And in 1987, Marv Wolfenson and Harvey Ratner were awarded an NBA expansion franchise, and the Timberwolves were born. I actually attended the first game. It was at the Metrodome on November 8, 1989 against Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. They eventually moved into their current home at Target Center. When it was built, Marvin Harb said that Target Center would remain privately owned. But in 1993, the same year that the North Stars left, they threatened to move the team if the city didn't buy the facility to help them pay off the rest of their mortgage. Negotiations took place and the legislature approved a deal for the facility to be bought and publicly owned. But Marvin Harv decided to sell the team to New Orleans anyway. Fortunately, David Stern and the NBA rejected the deal and eventually the Wolves were sold to Glenn Taylor. The Timberwolves have made the playoffs nine times in their 29-year history and lost in the first round of all those appearances except for one. They made a run in 2004, and had it not been for an injury to Sam Cassell, they might have won it all. Most fans attribute the team's misfortune to bad luck in the draft. What they don't realize is that our bad luck seemed to start with the very first pick. In the 1989 NBA College Draft, the Timberwolves selected Pooh Richardson, making him the first Timberwolf, right? 
If you asked most Minnesotans who the first Timberwolf was, that's what they'd say. But that's not true. A few weeks before Pooh was drafted, the NBA held an expansion draft for the two new teams, the Wolves and the Magic. The Wolves selected 11 players left unprotected by other teams. The first player taken by the Wolves? Detroit Piston, Rick Mahorn. Mahorn was one of the Detroit bad boys. They were known for their aggressive and intimidating defensive style of play. Most of the Minnesota media was ecstatic and even declared the pick the team's first victory. Three months later, shortly before the season started, the Timberwolves hosted a weekend-long basketball celebration on the streets of downtown Minneapolis called Hoopfest. It was to promote the team and get fans excited about the upcoming season. From Lincoln Center in downtown Minneapolis, KSTP Channel 5 and the Minnesota Timberwolves present Hoopfest on 5. It included a three-on-three -three tournament, a media game, a slam dunk contest, and a televised game featuring three of the first Timberwolves, Rick Mahorn, Tyrone Corbin, and Pooh Richardson. Their opponents were some fans who won a drawing by a local TV station. I was one of those lucky fans. Mahorn zeroed in on guarding me because I was wearing a Michael Jordan shirt. It was the only NBA shirt I had. He was clowning around with me about it, pushing, tripping, and at one point he grabbed it and it ripped. After that weekend, Mahorn requested to renegotiate his contract and held out of training camp. The Wolves ended up trading him to Philadelphia before the season started. Ironically, the Wolves got their first win in franchise history a few weeks later against Mahorn and the Sixers. I grew up thinking he was a jerk. He ripped my shirt, and he didn't want to play for Minnesota. But 25 years later, the Bad Boys film came out. It documented the Pistons' rise and their battles with the Bulls for superiority in the East. Bumars went down, knocked down by Jordan, and Mahorn took Jordan down, and now the Bulls, of course, retaliate. We got a fist fight now. And all the folks on both teams are involved, and Doug Collins was shoved to press row, and they're still at it. They're coming down. It also addressed the expansion draft. On the very same day Mahorn was chosen by Minnesota, he was celebrating the Pistons' first NBA championship that they had won two days earlier. Mahorn was told about it during the celebration, and he had to clean out his locker right then and there. It was the highest of the high and the lowest of the lows. It hurts even talking about it a little bit because, you know, I wanted to be that person to protect it. But, you know, excuse me. And you, and you guys are now, I understand, not going to be the bad boys next year. Is that right? No, because, um, you know, one of our team members was traded, well, actually what? got picked up in expansion draft. Right. He was uh, unprotected, and the Minnesota Timberwolves. Wahoos got him, or whoever. <laughs> the Minnesota Sea Otters, or... I don't think wearing that shirt made a difference in whether he stayed or not, but looking back at how the whole thing affected him, I feel like an idiot for welcoming the first Timberwolf to Minnesota like that. I wish I could tell him that today and apologize. In 1984, NBA owners approved a draft lottery. The goal was to prevent teams from purposely losing to get the first pick. Previous to that, a coin flip between the two worst teams in each conference was used to decide who picked first. The first NBA draft lottery was held in 1985. The New York Knicks won the rights to select Patrick Ewing instead of Indiana or Golden State, who had worse records. And ever since that moment, rumors have swirled about the lottery being fixed. Minnesota fans know all too well how the Wolves have fared in the lottery. This is a graphic ranking each team in terms of how lucky they've been in the draft. I'll give you one guess who's in last place. In the team's near 30 years of existence, they've had only one first overall pick. And it took 26 years to get it even though they've finished with the worst record in the league three times and in the bottom three countless others. But the lottery isn't rigged, right? 
So without winning the draft lottery, here's some of the picks the Wolves tried to build a franchise with. Did you notice there weren't first round picks in the early 2000s? That's because the Wolves forfeited those picks as punishment for having a secret contract with Joe Smith that illegally avoided the salary cap. Owner Glenn Taylor and Vice President Kevin McHale were both suspended. And even though McHale claimed he knew nothing about it, he said that most teams do deals like that. The Wolves just got caught. Originally they were penalized five years of picks, but the league reinstated some. Duty EB. In the NBA, it's not always about who was picked, it's often about who wasn't. In 2009, Wolves GM David Kahn drafted Ricky Rubio with the fifth pick. I'm Ricky Rubio, I'm not like anybody else. And Johnny Flynn with the sixth. Who got picked at seven? We had two top ten picks that year and passed on Steph Curry both times. We did hit on Kevin Garnett. You're welcome, Boston. I feel like I'm forgetting someone. Stop me if you've heard this before. The owner doesn't want to bring in big money free agents. He lets his best players leave or trades them because he's reluctant to pay competitive salaries. The team's total payroll is consistently in the bottom half compared to the other major league teams. If you thought I was talking about Carl Polad, you're wrong. The Twins had that reputation long before he bought the team. So let's go back to the beginning. The Washington Senators played their first game in the American League versus the Philadelphia Athletics on April 26, 1901. In 1919, former player and manager Clark Griffith purchased a controlling interest in the team and was named president. Ironically enough, one of the reasons he bought the team was that he was frustrated with the previous owner's penny pinching. The Senators played at National Park, which was renamed Griffith Stadium after Clark bought the team. They won a World Series in 1924. Griffith was elected to the Hall of Fame as an executive in 1946 and owned the team until he died in 1955. When he died, ownership was transferred to his nephew, Calvin. In August 1960, the American League voted to expand, and in October, the Twin Cities was granted an expansion team. Calvin made a deal with league officials where he could move his team to Minnesota and Washington would receive the expansion team instead. And in November 1960, the team was officially renamed the Minnesota Twins. The Twins played their first game on April 11, 1961, beating the Yankees 6 0 in New York. They played their first home game on April 21st at Metropolitan Stadium, losing to the expansion Senators 5 3. The first 10 years were fairly successful. They played in the World Series in 1965, losing to the Dodgers, and were in the American League Championship Series in 69 and 70, losing to the Orioles both times. Despite that early success, Griffith was notoriously tight-fisted as an owner. Mudcat Grant once said that Griffith was so cheap, he threw nickels around like they were manhole covers. In 1970, Kurt Flood filed a lawsuit against Major League Baseball to open the door for free agency. Griffith hated free agency and was very much opposed to it. He refused to pay competitive salaries to keep his players, 
He either let them sign elsewhere or traded them. He believed baseball was a business, and he would make his decisions based on that. In 1977, Rod Carew won the batting title and the American League MVP, all while making less than other stars around the league. Carew was frustrated with Griffith's penny-pinching ways. He also saw his teammates leaving and getting big paychecks to play elsewhere. Carew made $200,000 in 1977. He was willing to extend his contract if the salary was competitive and if Griffith made an effort to improve the team. Even though Carew wanted around $700,000, Calvin originally offered $250,000 because he said he couldn't afford it. Carew was upset and said he would never sign with the Twins again. Then in September 1978, Griffith made some racist remarks in a speech in Wasika, which made Carew even more upset. So eventually Calvin traded him to the Angels. Carew re-signed with the Angels for $800,000 for the 1979 season. In 1982, there were rumors that Griffith was looking to sell the team. He traded five veteran players at the beginning of the season in cost-cutting moves, four of them within 48 hours. Fans were not happy about it. That season, the team lost 102 games, which would stand as the Twins' worst record ever until 2016. But because of those losses, they earned the number one draft pick the following year. With that pick, they selected a pitcher named Tim Belcher. He wanted a minimum of $125,000 for a bonus or he wouldn't sign. For reference, the number two pick, Kurt Stillwell, got $140,000 for a signing bonus. Calvin refused to pay a bonus that high, so Belcher refused to sign and was drafted by the Yankees in the secondary phase. Other owners were baffled by Calvin's behavior. Most believed he could have signed Belcher and then traded him for $200,000. When he was asked about losing Belcher, Griffith said it's not the first time we've lost something. The reporter responded, but it's the first time you've had the number one pick. Calvin said, and I hope we never have it again. As excited as fans were when Griffith finally sold the team in 1984, that frugal philosophy didn't change much. Under Carl Polad's ownership, they won the World Series in 1987 and 1991, but both of those championships were done on a relative budget. The 87 team was in the bottom half of the league in salary, and the 91 team was in the middle of the pack. Following the 91 championship, Jack Morris signed with the Blue Jays. Many Twins fans were upset because they thought the Twins had a decent shot at repeating as champions the following year. Morris told the story about leaving the Twins on local radio. He said, I had lunch with Carl. He knew my value, and he told me, you're a businessman, you have to go to Toronto and get the money, because I'm saving mine for Kirby. The 92 team ended up finishing second in the division, and Toronto won the World Series. Before we go any further, we need to address some major events that affected the rest of the story. In August 1994, baseball players went on strike. Owners were trying to institute a salary cap because they claimed their profits were shrinking. The players were opposed to the salary cap. The World Series was canceled that year. But the following spring, players returned to work after a federal judge ruled against the owners, even though the financial issues still weren't resolved. Even though baseball was back, Fans were very unforgiving. They were upset, and they let the league know with their attendance. On September 6, 1995, the minor league St. Paul Saints outdrew the Twins in attendance for the day. The players and owners finally agreed to a collective bargaining agreement in 1996, but instead of a salary cap, they agreed to a revenue sharing plan. The larger market teams would share a percentage of their profits with the smaller market teams. The smaller market teams were to use their shared profit in an effort to improve their performance on the field. Notice that doesn't specifically say anything about player salaries. In September 1995, Twins officials tell Legislative Task Force that the Metrodome is obsolete and can't generate the revenues they need to remain competitive in Major League Baseball. After the legislature denied public funding for a new baseball stadium, Major League Baseball gave Polad permission to sell the team in 1997. A month later, it's reported that Don Beaver, a nursing home mogul from North Carolina, approached the Twins officials about buying the team. In September, the Star Tribune reports that Polad has an offer from Don Beaver, but a day later he denies that report. 
Ten days later, Polad begins negotiations with Beaver, and claims it's not a ploy to pressure Minnesota for a new stadium. On October 3rd, Polad signs a letter of intent to sell the Twins to Don Beaver. In May of 1998, North Carolina citizens vote against the plan. On December 24th, it's reported that the Twins will be slashing their payroll from $27 million in 1998 to 10 to $15 million for the following season. So far, we've talked about the Lakers and the North Stars leaving, and the Timberwolves threatening to. This part isn't about being sold or moving. It's about the franchise being eliminated, as in gone, cease to exist. On December 18th, 2000, the Star Tribune quotes Carl Polat as saying he wants no part of contraction, and his objective is to keep baseball here. In October 2001, the first reports surface of contraction officially happening before the 2002 season, with the Expos and Marlins named as possible candidates. A few days later, the Twins are rumored to be a candidate. On October 31st, Polad denies that he asked for a buyout from his fellow owners. November 6, the owners vote 28-2 in favor of eliminating two teams for the 2002 season. Just a few days later, Jim Polad sends a letter to Twins employees saying, why should the Minnesota Twins not be contracted? We are unable to find a plausible answer. November 15th. In reference to the lack of progress on a new stadium, Commissioner Bud Selig tells Minnesotans they should look themselves in the mirror. The next day, a Minnesota judge grants an injunction filed by the Metropolitan Sports Commission to force the Twins to play in 2002. The Twins and Major League Baseball appeal. On November 24th, Alabama businessman Donald Watkins says he wants to buy the Twins. On January 8th, 2002, it's reported that Polad loaned Sea League and the Brewers $3 million in 1995, which is a violation of Major League Baseball rules. The next day, Major League Baseball gives Donald Watkins permission to make an offer to buy the Twins. But it's eventually discovered that he doesn't have the finances. January 17th, Jim Polad says his father has not volunteered for contraction, and Twins president Jerry Bell says he's tired of hearing that accusation. January 22nd, the Minnesota Court of Appeals upholds the injunction that forces the Twins to honor their lease. The Twins and Major League Baseball then file an appeal to the Minnesota Supreme Court. But on February 4th, the Minnesota Supreme Court refuses to hear that appeal. The following day, Bud Selig calls contraction off for 2002, but says it's still a possibility in the future. April 1st, 2002, the Twins open their season with a win over the Royals. A few weeks later, Judd Zulgad and Randy First report that the Twins may have volunteered for contraction as early as April of 2001. Remember, that's six months before the first reports of contraction even happening, and well before all the denials about volunteering. In what seems to be a giant middle finger to all those who tried to contract the team, the Twins win the division and advance to the postseason. And on the 6th of October, the Twins beat the Oakland A's in the division series and advance to the ALCS. On that very same day, during the postgame celebration, Carl Polad finally admits volunteering the team for contraction and says he doesn't feel guilty in the least. A week later, the Twins lose the American League Championship Series to Anaheim four games to one. For the next few years, different ideas were brought up for a new stadium, but the legislature never approved anything. In February 2006, a Hennepin County District Judge rules that Polad can sell or relocate the team after the 2006 season. Just three months later, the Minnesota Legislature approves funding for the ballpark bill. In May 2007, Target Field construction begins with an official groundbreaking ceremony held later that year. 2010 brought the inaugural season at Target Field, and the Twins beat the Red Sox 5-4 in the first game played there in April. Carl Polad didn't get to see that first game at Target Field. He died in 2009 at age 93. His estimated worth was $3.6 billion, which ranked him at number 102 on the Forbes 400 Richest Americans list. Remember when the Twins said they needed a new stadium to be competitive? The year the Target Field opened, the Twins were ranked 10th in the league in payroll. Here are the Twins' payroll ranks since then. Like it or not, that's the way Major League Baseball is structured. 
With revenue sharing in its present form, it essentially allows small market teams to make money without having to be competitive. Winning championships today is costly. It can be done on a budget, but it's not very likely. Since 1992, only five of the 26 World Series champions were from small markets. And even then, spending money is not a guarantee. Putting money into winning a championship is a financial risk. So it's safer for a team like the Twins to try to develop talent rather than buy it. Since that ALCS run in 2002, the Twins haven't fared very well in the postseason. They've made six appearances but gained a reputation for early exits at the hands of the big bad Yankees. Phil Cuzzy didn't help the situation either. Fly ball down the left field line, that ball slicing, and it is a foul ball. The tip of the glove in fair territory, and then lands fair. Wow. But I'm becoming convinced that most Twins fans aren't as upset about the championship drought as I am. And I say that out of love, because my dad is one of those people. He's one of the most unconditionally loyal Twins fans I know. When postseason talk comes up, his response is usually about the two championships and how often they've won the division. He also has an interesting way of looking at their success or lack thereof. All right, so tell me again about your, your theory about the probability of winning a World Series. Well, how many major league teams are there? There's 30. Okay, so the probability of winning the World Series is 1 in 30. Twins have won 2 in the last 31 years, which is way over average. So you, th you think they're doing better than expected because they've won two out of 31? Yes. And honestly, I think that's how a lot of Twins fans think. They're pretty proud of those championships. And even though the last one was 28 years ago, to my dad, waving his homer hanky still feels like yesterday. And who doesn't love a day at the ballpark, whether they win or lose? Don't ever say Minnesotans aren't loyal. So where does that leave us? They won the division this year and broke the team home run record. They weren't expected to be this good. This might be the best lineup the Twins have ever had. And because of that, many fans were critical when they didn't make a bigger move at the trade deadline to bolster the pitching staff. And guess who they're playing in the first round? Regardless of what happens in October, it'll be very telling what the Twins do in the offseason. Will they go after any big name free agents? Or will they keep working their farm system with all these prospects we keep hearing about? But by the time these prospects get called up, how many players from this year's roster will have moved on to other teams? It's just the way it seems to go around here. So when do you think the Twins will win their next championship? Do you think they'll ever win another one? In the World Series? Yeah. Somewhere in the next 30 years. <laughs> we better move on. I think my bilateral leg weakness is starting to flare up. This quote is from a poster I used to have at work. A visitor once saw it and said, A true Vikings fan wouldn't have something like that. I replied, Only a true Vikings fan would understand it. Vikings, the Vikings are the undisputed kings of Minnesota sports heartbreak. We were the first team to lose four Super Bowls. We've all covered our eyes when the Vikings line up for a field goal or got that feeling in the pit of our stomachs when they start to blow a fourth quarter lead. And Minnesotans know exactly what I'm talking about, because they've lived it. It's a shared experience. It's a here-we-go-again mentality. Being a Vikings fan requires a thicker skin, and is definitely not for the faint of heart. Have you ever noticed that other teams' highlights are always against the Vikings? This is from 1988. It was third and two from the Vikings' 49-yard line. At this point, the Vikings were up by four points with under two minutes left. Remember this one? Dallas running back Tony Dorsett ran for a record 99-yard touchdown against the Vikings. What's worse, the Cowboys only had 10 men on the field. Speed, 99 yards and a half. Dorsett down the sideline. Stays in bounds. Just try looking up Barry Sanders' highlights. Who do you think most of those will be against? 
Dodge run. Full speed left. Ert, stop. Ert, go. You're not going to tackle him. Forget it. Let's address the elephant in the room. I'm often accused of being overly superstitious, but you can't tell me it's a good omen when a balloon carrying your mascot crashes in the pregame ceremony of your first Super Bowl. Fans in the stands began fleeing for their lives. The balloon then crashed in the lower deck. The Vikings were considered the best team in both leagues and were favored by 12 points. Kansas City head coach Hank Stram orchestrated a masterpiece on both sides of the ball in what is considered one of the greatest upsets in NFL history. Larry Zonka and the Dolphins ran for a combined 196 yards on our Purple People Eaters in Super Bowl VIII. Bob Greasy only threw seven passes in this game. So take me back. So take me back to the good old day. Not only did the Steel Curtain defense hold the Vikings to 17 rushing yards, but five turnovers were the story for the Vikings in Super Bowl IX. To the burdens we would shoulder and the struggles we would find, but growing may us strong as strong. In Super Bowl XI, the Raiders rushed for a record 266 yards. For as great as Tarkington was, he only threw one touchdown pass in the three Super Bowls he played in. And once again, turnovers would be the difference in the game. There's another little quick flip. Look out. There, there he goes. goes. Goodbye. Grabbed off. Willie Brown on Goodbye. his way. Willie, Willie Brown, the veteran. He the waited line. for that one. 14 oh. years, Willie's waited. Those were the times. Those four Super Bowl losses have really messed with our heads. Our obsession with getting back there and the misfortune involved has caused a sort of fatalism to develop in many of us, always assuming the worst is going to happen. In December 1975, the Vikings suffered what might be considered their first heartbreak trying to get back to the Super Bowl. With the Vikings leading 14-10 and just under 30 seconds left in the divisional playoff, Cowboys quarterback Roger Staubach threw a deep pass to Drew Pearson. Pearson pushed down Vikings defender Nate Wright to catch the game-winning touchdown and propel the Cowboys to the NFC Championship. Now let's watch the play by Pearson here. He's very well covered at this point. Looks like almost there's something. You see him coming back right there to make the catch. Nate Wright falls down. And by the way, that's not a flag. Someone threw an orange peel. Someone also threw a whiskey bottle at the referee. After the game, Staubach said he just threw up a prayer, and the term Hail Mary was born. In 1987, the Vikings backed into a wildcard spot with an 8-7 record. But they went on a playoff run, upsetting the Saints and the 49ers, only to have it end at the goal line in the NFC Championship. On fourth down, behind by seven with 56 seconds left, Darren Nelson dropped a pass from Wade Wilson at the goal line that could have tied the game. There may have been some confusion on the play, though. Vikings receiver Anthony Carter was right behind Nelson. And then there's 1998. And Anderson hasn't missed in two years. So that's a pretty good bet if you say, do you think Gary Anderson will make this field goal? The answer should probably be yes. 39 yards away. And it's not good. Everyone remembers Anderson's miss, but we often forget that the Vikings took a knee and played for overtime. The Vikings had one of the best offenses in the entire history of the NFL that year, and we took a knee to play for overtime. Still makes me angry. I don't even know what to say about this one. I'm pretty sure our team showed up. Remember 12 men in the huddle? I bet the name Tahi is popping into your head right now. The truth is, that wasn't Tahi's fault. Brad Childress changed the play at the last second. 
after a timeout, causing the penalty. And then the interception happened. Brett Favre goes back to pass. He pumps. Now he fires over the middle. Intercepted. I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. And eventually we learned about Bounty Gate. And don't forget the Cardinals' 4th and 25 last-second touchdown, knocking the Vikings out of playoff contention in 2003. Get back, Here it is. The season's on the line. Two receivers left and right. McCown takes the snap. He steps up. He's all by himself. Fires into the end zone. Touch! Touchdown! No! No! The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs! In 2016, Blair Walsh missed this potential game-winning kick versus Seattle. McDermott is the snapper. And the kick is no good! We've all seen the viral videos of people losing their minds during the Minneapolis Miracle. My reaction was a little different. I got so worked up watching us blow that 17-point lead that I got sick and had to go outside. This is actual footage from my doorbell camera after we won. I felt like we had just escaped death and it would come looking for payment. And wouldn't you know it, death came calling the following week. And just when we thought it was safe to believe again. Did you know that the Green Bay Packers almost left the NFL? Their first season in the league was 1921. Their first game was against the Minneapolis Marines. That game was considered to be a litmus test to see if they were going to continue playing in the professional league. The Marines scored first on a three-yard plunge by Ben Dvorak, but Eber Sampson missed the kick. Minneapolis held that 6 to nothing lead for three quarters, but near the end of the game, the Packers scored to tie it up, and Curly Lambeau kicked the game-winning extra point. Yes, that Curly Lambeau. According to some historians, had the Marines won that game, the Packers may not have continued in the league. You heard that right. A Minnesota football team had the chance to get rid of the Packers, and not only did they fail, it was because of a kicker. How Minnesota sports is that? As long as we're already talking about kickers, let's open a vein. Gary Anderson wasn't the first Vikings kicker to miss a crucial field goal, but that miss sure seems like a seminal moment in our modern era of field goal follies. When Anderson's contract expired in 2002, the Vikings decided not to resign him because he couldn't do kickoffs and signed Doug Bryan instead. In Bryan's second game, he missed two extra points, which led to the game going to overtime and the Vikings lost. And on his way home from the game, head coach Mike Tice called into a radio fan line show to rip on his own kicker. A few days later, Gary Anderson was brought back in, and Brian was eventually released. In the sixth round of the 2012 NFL Draft, Vikings GM Rick Spielman selected kicker Blair Walsh. Walsh's field goal accuracy in his senior season at Georgia was only 60%, but Spielman felt he had a strong leg. Walsh did well his first season as a Viking. He led the league in field goals made and hit a 56-yard field goal that tied a team record. In 2014, Walsh finished the season as one of the NFL's least accurate kickers. Despite that, the Vikings gave him a four-year contract extension that summer. We all know how that season ended, but his struggles continued into the 2016 season. After missing an extra point to the Redskins, Walsh was released and replaced by Kai Forbath. A year after drafting Walsh, Spielman drafted punter Jeff Locke in the fifth round. At that time, only nine punters had been drafted. Ever. Six years to the exact day of drafting Blair Walsh, the Vikings drafted another kicker, Daniel Carlson, this time in the fifth round. Less than 20 kickers have been drafted in the fifth round or higher since 2000. According to 538's Michael Salfino, a fifth round pick for a kicker is more like a first rounder for any other position. Carlson lasted two games. He was cut after missing three field goals in a game with the Packers that ended in a tie. The Vikings signed veteran kicker Dan Bailey. Bailey was statistically one of the most accurate kickers in NFL history. 
So you would think the Vikings finally had their man, right? During training camp the next year, the Vikings traded a fifth round pick to the Ravens for kicker Corey Vedvik. So essentially it was like drafting another kicker with a fifth round pick. And then the Vikings cut him three weeks later. The Vikings have had their fair share of scandal as well. Remember this old TV show? Love, exciting and new. Come That's not the image Vikings fans get in their head when they hear the phrase, Love Boat. In 2003, the Vikings signed free agent corner Fred Smoot. Ironically, it was the same exact day that rumors started to surface about head coach Mike Tice's ticket scalping scandal. Tice would eventually be fined $100,000 for selling Super Bowl tickets. Let's get back to Fred Smoot. I'm not sure I should call him the captain or the activities director, but that year, Smoot was in charge of the team's bye week rookie party. On October 6, 2005, Vikings players set sail on Lake Minnetonka with exotic dancers flown in from around the country on a boat ironically named Mischievous and had a party that would make Hugh Hefner blush. That is a disgusting act. The Vikings were in the midst of a push for a new stadium, and owner Ziggy Wilf was said to be extremely upset. Speaking of dinghies, ever hear of a Wizenator? Neither had I until 2005 when Vikings running back Ontario Smith was busted with one at the airport. Apparently it's a prosthetic limb that helps players trick drug testing officials with fake urine. It's so famous, a bar in Mankato purchased Smith's Wizenator and put it on display to attract business. In October 1989, Vikings general manager Mike Lynn traded what he thought were five players and a first, second, and sixth round pick to Dallas in exchange for running back Herschel Walker. What Lynn didn't know was that newly hired Dallas coach Jimmy Johnson had no intention of keeping the players. Johnson knew he could get more of the Vikings draft picks by cutting the players. It would eventually become the biggest trade in the history of the NFL, and Johnson declared that he had just committed the great train robbery. All said and done, Johnson got eight of the Vikings draft picks and used them to rebuild the Cowboys into a dynasty, and they won three Super Bowls in the 90s. I don't know about you, but I've had about enough of Dallas. As long as we're talking about draft picks, let's look at some of the other head scratchers too. In the 1982 draft, the Vikings selected Disco Darren Nelson. Nelson wanted nothing to do with Minnesota. As a matter of fact, he wrote the Vikings a letter asking them not to draft him because he didn't feel Minnesota fit his disco lifestyle. A reporter asked him if he thought that Minnesota didn't have discos, and Nelson replied that he didn't want to go to a disco and listen to country music. And not only did we draft Nelson when he didn't want to come here, we drafted him ahead of future Hall of Famer Marcus Allen, who was chosen three picks later. Oh, and there's this. In April 2003, the Vikings were slotted to have the number 7 overall pick. But they failed to get their card to the podium in time, and ended up picking ninth after Jacksonville and Carolina quickly took advantage of the Vikings' mistake. Apparently the Vikings were trying to trade with Baltimore, but in the words of Ravens GM Ozzie Newsome, the trade was never consummated. I think that means we got screwed. The Vikings claim they got the player they wanted anyways in Kevin Williams but we most likely lost some extra draft picks by not trading down. In 2005, the Vikings used a first round pick on wide receiver Troy Williamson in an attempt to replace the recently traded Randy Moss. They also had another pick in that round. At number 18, they selected defensive end Erasmus James. Oh yeah, and this guy went at number 24. Back to Williamson, the guy that was gonna replace Randy Moss. He was fast, but he couldn't catch. Taylor and Tony Richardson in the backfield. Tavares Jackson with time. Puts it up deep. He's got a man wide open. And Williamson dropped it. Troy Williamson dropped it. He was... The Vikings thought it was a vision problem and sent him to see specialists at Nike. Yeah, that makes sense. 
In 2011, the Vikings used the 11th overall pick on Christian Ponder. But by far the strangest draft pick situation the Vikings ever had was in 1999. They selected Demetrius Underwood after his coaches at Michigan State warned them not to. After Underwood signed his contract, he walked out of practice the next day and didn't return. He said he was struggling to resolve the conflict between football and his faith. The Vikings released him and he forfeited most of his bonus. On a final draft related note, when quarterback Teddy Bridgewater was severely injured at training camp prior to the 2016 season, the Vikings traded with the Philadelphia Eagles for quarterback Sam Bradford, giving up some draft picks, including a first rounder in 2017. The Eagles used that pick to draft defensive end Derek Barnett. In the 2018 NFC Championship game, that very same Derek Barnett had a strip sack on Vikings quarterback Case Keenum, causing a turnover and giving the Eagles momentum. Philadelphia never looked back, and we all know what happened after that. And now we've come full circle, but that's got me feeling like I need to go back on my front steps again. By the way, did our visiting fans really have to dress Rocky in purple? For a team like ours, with bad demons to begin with, that's just asking for it. Especially from a fan base that has a reputation for being a little riled up. Raise your hands And you know that it's true I got nothing to lose And I know I'm not cool So what have we learned? Although Minnesota sports continue to be tortured, so is Cleveland. It's like we're kindred spirits in some sort of weird cosmic universe of disappointment. Whether he's to blame or not, we've learned that Norm will always suck. We've learned that the NBA draft lottery is rigged. After doing some math, we learned that the Twins are about due for another championship. But we also learned that revenue sharing just doesn't add up. We've learned that kickers should be banned and the NFL should only allow teams to go for two. Okay, well, at least stop drafting kickers. Please. We've learned that it's not all bad. Minnesota's had some success and we're proud of the championships that we do have. The Minneapolis Lakers won six championships in the 40s and 50s, even though Google still won't acknowledge that they were won in Minneapolis. The Minnesota Twins have won the World Series twice. and the women's teams in Minnesota have somehow avoided the curse. And not only that, the Minnesota Lynx are tied for the most championships in the history of the WNBA. And lastly, we've learned that Minnesota fans are unconditionally loyal. But also have a good sense of humor about our misfortune. So where does that leave us? Our hope in creating this film was to exercise our demons. The Believe Land documentary had a happy ending. Will this one? Just made a great play. Took the faked the guy on the outside, stepped inside him, and uh, made the block. It was uh, a hell of a uh, game. I mean, I mean, uh, for 23 bucks, if you can get more excitement than that, uh, hell, you're in the wrong uh, operation. It was a hell of a hell of a game. 
And let me say something. As long as I'm in this job, Snelker will be the offensive coach. I mean, no, no question about that. No, no, no question about that. Now, we, uh, I don't like to name names after a, after a game. But we, we, can't, we can't be responsible for the blocking. We can't be responsible for the guys jumping offside. We can't be responsible for... We get down there and, and, uh, and it was a dumb play by, by Anderson. I love, I love Anderson. But it was a dumb play when, he had, when his foot was... Uh, shoe was coming off up the line screen. We were hard to take time out. We had a trap play called. And, and, he, and his, his shoe comes off. That, 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 ain't, that ain't Bob Schnelker's fault. We have another trap play. And if, and if, if any picks up his... Feet, he walks in. We got the pass to uh, 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 AC out there in the flat. Is the ball thrown in at, at low? That ain't, that isn't Snelker's fault. We got right down there. We got we got the second down and, and I don't know what the hell. Two two yards ago, I don't know what 15, 40, whatever the hell it was, and uh, and Irwin uh, uh, jumps offside. Now I, uh, these are the things that have been hurting us all along. The little things. We're working at them to stop them. We moved the ball good today. We went down there and we didn't get the ball in the end zone. I think we did, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? No, you boy, we'll, we'll steer one up. We'll steer one up here before it's done. You know, we he did a sensational job. Kick seven, seven uh, uh, field goals. You can win a game many ways, many ways. Uh, uh, DJ, I, I, I was uh, happy when they kicked the ball to him. Yeah, last week, and on the Giants, Christ, he ran 65 yards. This time he fumbles the ball. What the hell, what the hell can you do? You can't, uh, uh, all you do is you prepare as thoroughly as you can. The guys play their asses off. Any other questions? The guy feel like afterwards. What? Or yeah, yeah. He felt like he felt like afterwards. Everybody booed. I mean, but he worked his ass off. And, he, and no smarter uh, uh, coordinator in football. They put his picture up there and the booed him. Thank <laughs>